Hello, my friend, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and I am excited to be joined today by Dr. Patty Barrett. Dr. Barrett is a Dublin, Ireland-based cardiologist who is a well-known thought leader in the space of all things related to heart health. He's done a lot in his career. He's uh, worked with the meditation app Headspace. He's partnered with NASA on medical device research. He's spent time doing research and training at Columbia University Medical Center, uh, as well as the Scripps Translational Science Institute in California, among several others. In short, he's done a lot. He also happens to be a great content producer, writing regularly on his weekly Substack as well as on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's where I found him and I love his stuff. So check out links to all of that in the show notes. In the following conversation, Dr. Barrett and I talk about all things cardiovascular health and more specifically, how to avoid a heart attack, something we probably all want to do. So we get into some details in this discussion. We talk about what a heart attack is and how it differs from cardiac arrest. We talk about what measures you should be looking at to assess your own risk. Uh, Things like LDL cholesterol and APOB and LP little a. There's a lot of stuff here uh, to wrap your head around. It can be confusing when you go to the doctor and you look at a lipid panel. You don't know what to focus on and what not to focus on. We try to demystify all of that in this conversation. We also talk about what tests you might want to consider getting to assess your current risk. So things like calcium scans and CT angiograms and stress echo tests. We talk about all of that stuff. And importantly, we talk about what you can do to lower your risk from diet to exercise to medication. So hopefully you will find this episode as informative and valuable as I did. Um, Before we dive in, just a quick reminder to subscribe to the Intentional Wisdom Newsletter. That's at gregcampion.substack.com. It's one email every other week. It's the best of what I'm learning from experts like Dr. Barrett. There are lots of numbers and figures thrown around in this episode, so I'm going to try to sum up all of that in this week's newsletter so that you don't have to take notes here on the fly in terms of what your specific APOB number should be. So check that out at gregcampion.substack.com. Finally, if you enjoy the show, please leave a review and a rating on your favorite platform or on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and YouTube and more. Every rating, comment, subscription, all of it, it helps a ton. That's it for my spiel. Here is Dr. Patty Barrett. All right. Dr. Patty Barrett, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. I'm excited to have you here. Um, as I was telling you kind of before we hit record, I've become such a big fan of uh, all the content that you put out on a daily and weekly basis. So I first came across your work on Twitter um, where I found you you know, posting a lot of just super helpful, interesting content on all things in particular, kind of heart-related health. And then, um, and then I subscribed to your newsletter as well, which is a weekly kind of Substack newsletter, and that's been awesome. So I'd I'd, I'd love to kind of dive in to some of that stuff that you're doing there. But maybe just kind of to start, it'd be cool to hear a little bit about your current cardiology practice, and also maybe like what your motivation was to kind of get into this more like content producing world, if you will. Uh, yeah, so um, much like anything, it was to try and solve my own problems. Um, I am a, a preventive cardiologist who started his journey as an interventional cardiologist um, and uh, realized that I was barking up the wrong tree. Um, and if you want to apply the greatest leverage to make the greatest benefit in terms of cardiovascular health, you need to start way before um, patients met you on the cath lab table. Um, so that was really my journey, um, really after kind of 20 years of training and ending up in some of the the biggest uh, institutions in the United States, and then realizing that maybe I'd gone down the wrong path. So I, at the very end of my career, had to climb right back down from from that podium and uh, and somewhat start again on my journey um, in terms of preventive cardiology. And that's where I end up now in terms of my clinical practice uh, here in Ireland. The, the The publication of any of the material that I do largely was out of my own um, 
challenge each day in clinic that, that there were certain core fundamentals and topics that I needed to get across to my patients. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of repetition of the same questions requiring the same answers. And rather than, you know, spending time going over that same idea or concept or really trying to emphasize a point, um, I decided I would just put these together in, in short mm -hmm. articles. And these were going to be um, pieces that I would share with my own patients. I made them freely available um, and really it just kind of grew out of that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are all the beneficiaries of that. So I'm going to, for our listeners, um, I'm going to link to your newsletter and uh, also to your uh, social media handles um, uh, in the show notes so they can check all of your stuff out there as I'm sure they will want to um, after they hear um, some of your thoughts on, on these topics. So Let's dive right in. I mean, I was tentatively thinking about calling this episode something like how to avoid a heart attack, um, which, uh, you know, is something that I think we're probably all interested in doing that. But maybe before we get into, you know, things like how do you, you know, measure um, your risk factors and, I've, and obviously how do you lower your risk factors, let's, let's kind of define our terms up front, if that's okay. So, if if you wouldn't mind, can you just describe to me what a heart attack actually is, or in other words, like what's happening in a person's body when they actually have a heart attack? Um, and I think this is a really important set of terms to get correctly, because if you don't set this up correctly, you get lost very quickly in terms of how you're trying to navigate the space. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about a, a book title that, uh, you know, I would write around this particular area, one of the the titles that uh, has always rung around in my head was Don't Have a Heart Attack as the uh, the mm -hmm. title. And yep. you, you, are, you are correct insofar as that the objective here is to not have a heart attack. Um, because given a long enough time horizon, uh, almost everyone will develop coronary artery disease at some point in their life. And so the, your objective here is to avoid the event that is a heart attack. So when we think about trying to tackle this problem, we have to look at this on a, on a math and probability basis. Um, we know that about one third of adults uh, in the developed world will die from cardiovascular disease. We know that it's the leading cause of death globally and kind of it equals all cancers combined. So as a, mm -hmm. you know, a prevalence issue, high prevalence. Um, in terms of the preventable factors that go into making up that mix, um, we know that about 80 to 90% of it uh, is explained. So we have levers that we can pull. But again, when we think about this idea of prevention, um, mm. we are, are slightly misleading in our terminology because really what it should be more accurately described as is delaying the onset. So when we think about heart attack, that is the end point. That is the what I think about as the third category, the outcome or the event. So heart attacks, strokes, these are events. You have to have the pathology, the disease, to give you the event. Mm -hmm. So you need the disease that is atherosclerosis, either coronary atherosclerosis or vascular atherosclerosis in your carotid yeah. arteries. And preceding that, you have risk factors. Now, the reality is, is that as you go through life, everyone starts off with no plaque in their coronary arteries and slowly starts to accumulate it over time. And as I said, given a long enough time horizon, you will eventually develop a significant amount of atherosclerosis and have a heart attack from that. But that might require you living to 200 years of age. Hmm. The question that a lot of people are always trying to understand is, is if we think about what is the average trajectory, say for a male or female, where are you on that trajectory? And are you accumulating plaque at a much faster rate compared to say an age match peer? And what that means for your risk of a heart attack. The thing that, that determines that the timing of onset and the steepness of that onset are the number of risk factors that you have during life and as you accumulate them throughout life. So again, risk factors mm -hmm. determine the timing of onset and the amount. The disease, the amount of the disease determines the risk of an event. And then the event is the thing that is likely to kill you. So risk factors don't cause you to die. Coronary atherosclerosis doesn't cause you to die. Heart attacks are the things that kill you. So this is one of the, the big confusion points. When people say that they have, say, high cholesterol, for example, or some other uh, risk factor for, cardi for cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. they go, I have high cholesterol, therefore I have heart disease. And mm -hmm. that, that is, is actually is very correct and can cause a lot of confusion and, and stress for people. So you need to be very clear. Our objective here is to minimize as much as possible the number of risk factors, to delay as long as possible the timing of the onset of the disease, and to minimize the progression over time so that to, to delay or avoid in its entirety the onset of an event in your life. And so when we talk about an event, 
plaque in the coronary arteries is, is the accumulation of an inflammatory process in the arteries. An event is when that plaque ruptures. So think about that as a gel-filled blister in your artery. That artery ruptures. That gel comes in contact with your blood. That sets off a, a, a kind of a cascade of thrombotic and clotting factors. And that clot then blocks the flow down the artery and the heart muscle downstream of that begins to die. And that is what a heart attack mm. is. Yep. Now, so again, this is its the most important thing. It's three categories, risk factors, disease, events. When you think about it that way, things get a lot more kind of straightforward. Got it. Okay. That's a great explanation. And then one more, just kind of define your terms uh, question up front. So there, there probably is still a bit of confusion out there in terms of, you know, how does a heart attack differ from cardiac arrest? Can you just describe that briefly? So what I would say is, is the, that if we were to add a fourth uh, extension point onto that, mm -hmm. the, the heart attack is the, the interruption of blood flow down, of the, down the artery to ultimately cause heart muscle death. That situation can, but not always, lead to an irregular heart rhythm where the electrical system of the heart fails. Um, and then basically your heart as a, as a muscle or a pump stops working in its entirety. So a heart attack is the most common cause of a cardiac arrest, but not the only cause. Mm. And not all heart attacks lead to cardiac arrest. And many heart attacks are even silent and have no symptoms. Right. Okay. And of course you can have cardiac arrest. Well, actually this is more of a question. You, I think you can have cardiac arrest without having cardiovascular disease. I'm thinking about LeBron James's son and uh, the Buffalo Bills player who had a cardio cardiac events, but I assume they don't have. So it, it depends yeah. on how you define cardiovascular disease. When okay. people say cardiovascular disease, it's really being used as a shorthand for coronary artery disease. Right. Cardiovascular disease is a much broader umbrella term that includes other genetic conditions like heart rhythm disorders, long QT syndromes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these, these are very, very different pathologies. And these are not in that same pathway of mm. risk factors, onset of disease, and then event. So when we talk about this, when we say heart disease or cardiovascular disease, 90% of the time, we're really referring to coronary artery disease. But mm -hmm. when you're seeing people have, say, sudden cardiac death in a younger individual, this is rarely about coronary artery disease. And you're, you're dealing with an entirely different animal. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I think the focus of our conversation here is going to be broadly about coronary artery disease, uh, which you describe as one of the leading causes of death in the world. Um, so if you think about, which is, it's kind of wild to think about, you know, you have something that's causing a third of deaths among adults, uh, but it, somewhat ironically uh, is one of the most preventable causes of death. Um, you know, based on the actions that you take, your nutrition, exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to talk about all that kind of stuff, but let's hit the risk factors. And I guess what I would want to do is talk about, you know, how do we measure our risk? So I think there's a decent amount of confusion out there. I think unless you've spent the time um, really looking into this, you may be confused about, okay, there's, I hear about good cholesterol. I hear about bad cholesterol. I get these, uh, lipid panel done, lipid panels done, uh, at my annual physical. And there's a bunch of numbers on there. I generally have an idea maybe what some of them mean, but I'm not really tracking them too closely. So why don't we talk about that? And I'd be, I'd be interested to get your view on what some of those best measures are that we should be focusing on. And then maybe even get into some details around like specific levels that you think would be good targets. So where would you, where would you start? So again, it's always with this three model categorization of risk factors, disease, mm -hmm. and event. So often the, the confusion is, is say, for example, and I know we're skipping ahead a little here, you do a cardiac CT that is looking for the disease, mm -hmm. a risk factor, say like a lipid panel is looking for the risk factor. Right. And so the, the analogy that uh, I, I use is that if you think about coronary atherosclerosis and the fundamental basis of coronary atherosclerosis is a lipid particle becomes retained in the artery wall and sets off an inflammatory cascade that ultimately leads to the build of a plaque in that wall. And if you make the analogy that, that the lipid particle is uh, basically a tennis ball being thrown at a piece of glass 
And when that tennis ball gets to the far side of the glass and becomes retained um, and then starts to accumulate there, that is plaque. When that basically that plaque ruptures and breaks the glass from the other side, that's the, the heart attack. If you look at this model, so that, that is the, kind of the base fundamental synchronon of coronary atherosclerosis. If you then look at this model and you say, okay, if I have high cholesterol, for example, um, and you have it for longer, i.e. a genetic type of cholesterol that's present very early in life rather than going to mm-hmm. appear later in life, you're mm-hmm. just simply throwing more tennis balls at that piece of glass. So it's, it's a probability game. It's just more tennis balls, just mm-hmm. throwing more tennis balls. If you have high blood pressure, you're just throwing those tennis balls harder. If you're a smoker, you basically walked up to the glass and hit it with a hammer. And it doesn't matter. You can just throw them straight through there. Wow. If okay. you have a, an elevated LP little a, which is a genetic type of cholesterol present in about 10 to 20% of the population, you are throwing cricket balls and tennis balls. If mm. you have degrees of insulin resistance and say diabetes at the more kind of extreme end of the insulin resistance phenotype, you're throwing golf balls and you are slowly cracking that glass. The reality is, is even though say you may have a genetic type of cholesterol, say higher cholesterol, familial hyperlipidemia, the reality is, is some people can tolerate those high numbers because of the strength of their glass. So we talk about the lifestyle factors in terms of high VO2 max, and high muscle mass, and all those kind of uh, those fitness metrics. Mm-hmm. You, you, can, you can tolerate that insult for longer, but eventually the, the, the integrity of that glass will begin to break down. So then when you say, okay, I'm going to think about my risk factors and how to think about my risk, you have to look at it through the lens of that model. What you want to have are as few of those tennis balls being thrown at that artery wall for as little as possible, as softly as possible, and making sure that they are tennis balls and not golf balls or cricket balls, and making sure that that artery wall is as strong as possible for as long as possible. And that is how all the the, the risk factors integrate together to give you your cardiovascular risk. Um, and so, so this, is, this is why you cannot look at risk factors in isolation. You have to see them in combination as a multifactorial process. And additionally, even though when we do look at the risk factors and we understand maybe what 90% of them uh, are in terms of the predictability of myocardial infarction, there are always unmeasured variables. Mm. So there are certain people who will not have any of the traditional risk factors so that when you actually then look at their coronary arteries, say with a cardiac CT at an earlier time point, you can often see excess plaque buildup. And so all that tells you is that there's an unmeasured variable at play. Sometimes you can find out what that is by looking a little further, but sometimes you can't. But regardless of whether you do or not, you can always, you can always identify that person at higher risk, regardless of an identifiable risk factor. Hmm. Okay. So uh, clearly there's lots of factors at play. There's, there's an individual element depending on genetics and such. Um, but e- even still, I'm going to try to pin you down on some numbers for some of these metrics, if, if you will. Sure. So should we start with LDL cholesterol? Would that be? So L- LDL cholesterol is, is the most commonly used cholesterol uh, master metric that we used. Historically, I mean, if you look at the relationship between total cholesterol and the rates of cardiovascular disease, the higher the total cholesterol, the higher the uh, rates of cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. On the basis that, that that was a reasonable proxy measure for the number of particles, even though we know that that technically is not actually uh, what it is measuring. LDL became a much more precise measure of that. Um, and again, in most populations who are insulin sensitive, using LDL as a proxy marker for the number of particles, those, those tennis balls, um, is, is pretty good. But remember here, we're assuming insulin sensitivity. Mm-hmm. And if we look at the statistics here, about 88% of the population will have one form, one, one metric of the metabolic syndrome at least. So therefore, what happens is, is the, the, the accuracy of using measures like total cholesterol or LDL become less reliable when you measure it against the gold standard, which is the number of ApoB particles. Now, if you look at your non-HDL, which is your total cholesterol minus your HDL, that gives you most of the time a very reasonable and, and good reliable indicator of what your, uh, your ApoB concentration is. So that is something that I think most people should be tracking if they're getting a, um, uh, you know, if they're getting a standard lipid panel. However, if you want to get the, the most accurate representation of risk in terms of the, the number of particles, um, it's going to be your ApoB concentration. Um, and then what you have to say is, is 
people people talk about their 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 cholesterol and their ApoB concentrations on, on on a very binary sense. They say it's either high or low. And the reality is is if you go back to your tennis ball analogy, that really can't be true. It's a continuous variable like speed. And if you look at the people who have genetic uh, predispositions to having exceptionally low numbers of ABOB particles, who have kind of variants of the PCSK9 uh, gene variant, they have effectively no coronary disease throughout their life. Their, their risk is about 88% less. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the number of risks, so we'll take the kind of the average uh, ApoB of kind of say, say one, for example, um, you know, that's like at about the 50th percentile. The, the reality is, is that when you look at that, when you, whether you adjudicate it as high or low is dependent on the time horizon you're going to have that amount of particles hitting your arteries mm-hmm. and how aggressively you want to reduce this. And we know that if, if you basically pull that down to the lowest possible levels, say the less than the fifth percentile, over a long enough time horizon, you, you reduce your risk, but you have to do it in combination with the other factors. So, and that is where you start to look at things like insulin resistance. And so we know that the, the, the extreme end of, of the insulin resistance phenotype is diabetes. And if you look over, say, a 20-year time horizon compared to someone who doesn't have diabetes, they're about 10 times more likely. So again, because you're turning those tennis balls into golf balls. So the key is, is don't get diabetes and don't get any of the, the, the earlier onsets of it, i.e. insulin resistance. Because if you, if you look at someone with, say, high ApoB concentrations, but no insulin resistance, they're about 80% more likely to develop coronary disease. But if they have high insulin resist, they have high markers of insulin resistance and high mm-hmm. ApoB, they're about 11 times more. Mm-hmm. So, so the key here is, depending on how aggressive you want to be, you pull your, your, your non-HDL or, or ideally an ApoB as low as possible. In the kind of the idealized sense, you would take it down to the less than the fifth percentile, which is about less than 0.6 or 60, kind of uh, depending on the, the units that you're, you're using. Mm-hmm. You maintain insulin sensitivity, and then you run a normal blood pressure as well. Um, you don't smoke. You are active to achieve the metrics of fitness that we would associate with the highest uh, performance measures and the, the kind of the longest longevity metrics. So that's going to be VO2 max, muscle mass as, a, as measured by a particular lean mass, muscle strength, uh, et cetera, and, and an aerobic base as defined by your, your lactate threshold or, or VO2 max, um, sorry, or metabolic heart testing. So at least here in the States, when you go to get your annual physical and they run a, a panel on your on your blood, they will give you, usually you will get LDL cholesterol, HDL, I think a total cholesterol number, mm-hmm. VLDL, whatever that is, and uh, triglycerides. So, and let's talk about the specifics on ApoB in, in just one second. But like, if you're looking at those numbers that I just mentioned, um, and fully taking on board that there are varying factors around insulin sensitivity, et cetera. But let's say you're, <clears throat> we, we can use me as an example. Let's say you're a 45 year old male. Um, if you, would you have a certain number in mind for LDL cholesterol or HDL or wh- which one would you focus on and what number would, would be kind of average 45 year old male, non diabetic, et cetera. So what you want to do is, I mean, if you're looking for the kind of the lowest levels um, in terms of, you know, less than the fifth percentile, you want an LDL kind of in terms of so that high risk population. Um, so it's someone with documented coronary disease as, and I, again, I'm, I'm working up my, my US uh, EU conversions here um, mm-hmm. at, about, uh, at about 40 um, okay. in terms of, you know, uh, so, so that's, that's, that's very low, but that's, that's the LDL. highest risk. Yeah. You know, yeah, so okay. that's, that's going to be, you know, you're going to be very, you're going to be pushing very hard and that's going to require medical therapies for that. But right. the way, the way I do it is, is, is again, you know, d- don't guess in terms of get an ApoB and, mm-hmm. and actually just, you know, go for kind of the, the lowest percentiles on that. If that is your objective mm-hmm. to do that. So, so the thing is, is that because most people will not know if they're insulin sensitive or not so that they're, they're speaking with very low confidence in terms of when they're giving you their standard lipid panel. And mm-hmm. so th- that is why I, you know, I, I tend to use that as, our, uh, the, as the metric. So kind of really what you're looking for is, you know, you want to have your non-HDL at less than the fifth percentile um, in the idealized sense. Now, I, I don't know what that is in the US metrics at the, at the top of my head, but you can easily kind of Google that. Um, uh, mm-hmm. I use the kind of the European ones. But so what you want that is less than the fifth percentile. And when we look at the triglycerides, if you correct for the number of ApoB particles, you're, you, you, you eliminate the risk of the, the higher triglycerides. 
but the higher triglycerides can give you an indication of whether you have a degree of metabolic dysfunction. And so when we look at things like HDL, for example, the reality is, is that the HDL that you see given to you on a standard lipid panel um, is being inferred as if it is giving an indication of HDL functionality, its efflux capacity. And the reality is, is it's not. And so therefore, it is, it, it is, it is not a reliable indicator to use in terms of it being kind of preventive or, or protective or not. What you see is, is that if you have someone who's got a high HDL and a low triglyceride, it is a reasonable proxy indicator that they're insulin sensitive. So, and they're also likely to have a low non-HDL. Um, and so, so these are kind of the things that you're trying to match up. Low, low non-HDL uh, or low ApoB count in the setting of a good HDL to triglyceride ratio likely means a low number of particles and likely means it's in the context of someone who is being insulin, who's insulin sensitive. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned <clears throat> 60 being a decent number. Was it 60 or 40, a decent number for, on the LDL? It's, it's about, it's about 40. So the, the, the units we use is about, are about 1.4 1. or 1. 1.8 for, yeah. for LDL. Um, uh, and so it's, you'll have to do the, the conversions. Um, I, I forget my US conversions. Okay. So, well, I'll tell you. Um, so here, I think our broad healthcare standards for LDL like is zero to 99 mill milligrams per and deciliter. that's that's going to be about an ldl of less than three millimole <clears throat> um so and I, I don't know if you've um read um outlive by dr Pedia, peter atia but he's he uh recommends some you know numbers that are quite lower than well, i guess what the typical u.s healthcare standards would uh, provide for so he's he in his mind uh kind of a target would be uh, under 20 to 30 uh, on LDL, which would be quite low. And I'm, I'm looking at a, a chart of my own that is tracked between 89 and 124 over the past five years. It sort of started low, went up, and then I've managed to get it back low again. Um, so that's kind of one broad number that I've been looking at. But to your point, ApoB, and I think Dr. Atia agrees with this, is that AP, ApoB is probably more predictive of cardiovascular diseases um, than LDLC. So probably a better measure to uh, to track. And for those in the states, I'm not sure what the what the story is in Europe, but for those in the states, this is not a standard measure that you get when you're in your normal physical. But it's also not very inaccessible in that. You can ask your doctor for it and it may be an extra 20 bucks or something like that. And so here, um, the I think the standard US kind of protocol for ApoB is to be under 90 uh, or 0.9, I guess, um, uh, in, in the way that you described it. Whereas again, Dr. Atia sort of thinking, you know, what would be optimal? And to your point, what would be throwing... I may miss I may mess up the analogy here, but let's say less tennis balls with, you know, less hard at, at a glass wall over time. He 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 recommends under thirty. My my only reading because I just became aware of this this year was seventy four. So I'm happy that it's below the ninety recommended, but I'd like to get that lower. Um, is that a decent summation or what do you what do you think about yeah. what I just said? There? And so 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 Peter's thesis is that if you actually look at say if you have what would be considered neonatal so as you were born levels of ApoB particles which are being kind of approximated by your LDL um, that you can effectively make coronary artery disease and orphan disease and so again I, I would tend to to agree with them even though that the guidelines to a, a degree that we, we look at and apply both European and American um, wouldn't really be as aggressive as that. Mm -hmm. But in my view, if you are looking to minimize the most prevalent and most preventable cause of death, where the, the fundamental process of it, it requires a lipoprotein particle and in general, lowering it is incredibly safe to do over long periods of time. And our observational data, and I'm quite specific in my language here, our observational data says that those with very low lifelong ApoB particles or LDL cholesterol have some of the lowest incidence of coronary artery disease. Now, what, what the challenge here is, is that there will never be a lifelong 
trial done in a randomized fashion. So we can only look at Mendelian randomization data or, or basically observational data. Um, and we also have to look at to get to those levels for most people will require pharmacotherapy. And then you have to juxtapose that against the potential downsides that go with a pharmacological intervention. Because most people will have a genetic floor in terms of where their ApoB particles will get to mm. when you actually pull the lever of you know, predominantly lifestyle factors to, to get it there. So if your target is to get it to those low levels, you, you will almost certainly require, for most people, um, a pharmacological intervention. Okay. Okay. But we may be, so let's, let's come to the, uh, the way we actually get these numbers down, um, in a minute, but, but the, I think the, the point that you're making and that Dr. Atia makes is that basically there's a, almost like a, and I've heard you describe it as like a compounding interest effect almost over time. So like the less pressure, uh, that you are putting on your system over the longest period of time uh, the better your potential outcome. I'm sure you can word that better, but. Yeah, well, well. so, so I suppose bearing in mind two things, because there's probably people listening to this and saying, listen, well, I heard that cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. And the thing is, is it is the fundamental basis of heart disease. The, 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 the discrepancy comes is that if, if you look at cholesterol and we're talking about ApoB particles, um, if you pour the gasoline of diabetes on top of that, then you 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 set a huge fire um, mm -hmm. in place. So the thing is, is you know, solely looking at this through the lens of of lipoproteins is is insufficient. Um, we need to do we need to manage those as one of the primary risk factors, but we also need to maintain insulin sensitivity as much as possible. And it's the combination of those two things together. And so, really, you're you're looking to to kind of minimize this as 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 much as possible. So we know that it's safe to 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 lower these to the, the ApoB concentrations to, to low levels. Uh, for most people, it will require a pharmacotherapy. For some patients, they will be intolerant to them. For some patients, uh, you know, it's, it's not an issue. Um, and so you, you, have to, you have to say then to yourself, you have to say, listen, where, where am I on this risk curve for, for this variable? Um, over what time horizon is this likely to be an issue? And we know that if you lower it earlier in life, you get a greater magnitude of benefit. And the compound interesting uh, uh, component is this, is that if you're throwing those tennis balls and you're lodging them in the archery wall, if you're just still throwing the same number of tennis balls, so here you've got a static 50th percentile ApoB or LDL, so it's kind of average, not particularly high, not particularly low, the plaque is still accumulating. So even though the, 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 your cholesterol isn't going up and up and up and up and up, you've got the same number been thrown in, So, but the actual deposit is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's when that deposit of atherosclerosis reaches a sufficient size in the context of other risk factors, then it ruptures. So as, as, you, as you reach kind of a threshold of risk, over time, risk starts to increase exponentially rather than on a linear basis. Um, and so, you know, I, you know from, from my perspective, it's just, you know, I look at it as a bit of a no-brainer. If you're very serious about reducing the, the, the most prevalent cause of preventable death, this is just one of the easiest ones to take off the table. Um, mm -hmm. Now you can, you can go a long way through nutritional approaches. Um, and some people, when they pull those levers, um, will, will have very meaningful reductions in those concentrations. But for some people, it, mm -hmm. it just won't, or, or, the, or that degree of a lifestyle intervention is going to not be sustainable over very long periods of time. Okay. If you had to pick one of the measures that we just talked about, would ApoB be the one that you would focus on? Yeah, I think for, for most people, I mean, there, there are obviously small cohorts of patients who have specific uh, disorders of triglycerides and a kind of a variety of genetic disorders. But for most people, um, mm -hmm. you're looking at the number of, of ApoB particles. And if you're going to be very aggressive about it, you want it below the fifth percentile, which is going to be 60 or 0.6, depending on the units that you're using. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to match that in the context of being normotensive and insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, actually, my last guest, <clears throat> we talked a lot about insulin sensitivity, and uh, in fact, I'm wearing a uh, CGM at the moment, so learning all about how different foods uh, impact my own uh, blood glucose levels, which has been kind of a fascinating little journey to be on. Um, 
one uh, one other measure in our blood that we didn't talk about before we before we move on here is LP little a, which I don't want to um, pass over. So can you just describe what this is and why it's uh, so important to be aware of your level? So LP little a is is the most common serious genetic cholesterol disorder uh, in the population. It affects about ten to twenty percent of the population, depending on the ethnicity. Um, and fundamentally, I mean, being being very precise or technical, um, it is not actually a cholesterol disorder. It's to do with your your ApoA1. Um, so there's a, basically, if you think of the the ApoB particle as like a tennis ball, the tennis ball has a tail, and that tail is called a Kringle repeat. Um, it's the, the levels of of LP little a are genetically determined, and so about eighty percent of the variance is genetically determined based on the LPAG. Um, and so this is something that say one in five people have very high LP little a levels. And that very high LP little a level puts them at considerably higher risk of early coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, and peripheral artery disease, uh, you know, in combination. And so the, the, the reality is, is this is often what one of those unmeasured variables actually is. So you, you have someone who comes in, they don't have any particularly, you know, uh, aggressive traditional risk factors. They maybe have a family history of, of earlier heart disease, or maybe they don't. Um, you do a CT scan and you see that they have a disproportionate or unexpected amount of, of early plaque. And then when you actually look um, at their LP little a levels, you, you find that they're, they're elevated. Um, and so this, this is, uh, I think, you know, in terms of when I, when I hear a story, which is a very common referral, is, is listen, I, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my risk of heart disease in the future. My dad had a heart attack at 50. His dad had a heart attack at 50. Mm-hmm. You know, my uncle had a heart attack at 50. LP little a is often the thing that's going to be the, the pathology that's actually driving that. Um, so, you know, so in terms of measuring your, your lipid risk, um, it's going to be ApoB and an LP little a, and you need only measure your LP little a once in life um, until we reach a time whereby we have approved therapies to actually lower LP little a, which are on the horizon. Okay. So um, <clears throat> my understanding is that, or based on what I've seen from my doctor's office, uh, the recommended or what they want to see is LP little a below 75. I had mine tested. I think I had to ask for this test specifically. Mine came you out would. at, a, okay. Mine came out at 11. Um, what do you want to see there? Is it the type of thing that's kind of binary? You either have elevated or you don't. Um, mostly. So it, it doesn't follow a normal Gaussian distribution in terms of kind of a, you know, it being normally distributed. So, you know, the majority of people is a very small number of people have most of the risk. Um, the, 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 the nanomole per liter reference ranges, I don't use as commonly. They tend to be cutoffs of greater than 50, greater than 75. Um, it's the, uh, milligrams per deciliter, uh, that, that we tend to use, but they, they kind of, they don't immediately translate. You can't do a, a direct kind of translation between the two of those. Um, but the, the higher levels of say greater than 75 or, or greater than 0.5, um, are associated with about a two to four times increased risk of, of premature cardiovascular disease. Um, we know that even between 0.3 and uh, 0.5, and so a rough approximation for the animals would be about you know, 50 to 75, um, there is incremental risk also. Um, mm-hmm. And so again, there, there is uh, you know, a continuous variable um, element to this. The, the, the challenge with LP little a is people will say, listen, there's no approved therapy, so why should I actually test it? Um, and yeah. so, you know, you know, and this is the classic pushback that, that patients will get in their doctor's office when they go in and do this. Um, and quite frankly, that's nonsense. Even if there were no way to reduce risk, which there is, even using standard therapies, the bottom line is, is patients are asking for an answer and they deserve one. Secondly, it, it gives an explanation as to what might be causing significant pathology and mortality in a family. You can then identify and cascade screen certain individuals. It often acts as a deal breaker in terms of whether or not to treat, say, someone with a pharmacological therapy, or uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of you're on the, they're on the fence about starting an antihypertensive or starting, a, you know, a lipid lowering therapy. It, it's always the the thing that, in my view, is the deal breaker. But the thing that we have learned uh, recently um, is that if you actually adjust for the number of ApoB particles and you can lower uh, blood pressure. And um, you can significantly reduce the overall risk of heart disease and, and premature events mm-hmm. and progression of plaque. 
So just because there is no dedicated approved therapy to lower the LT little a concentration in isolation does not mean that you cannot reduce risk. And th th these are two very important uh, uh, points to kind of make the distinction between these. Because people feel that like, well, I have this risk, there's nothing I can do about it. And the answer is, is th there is a substantial amount you can do about it. And then you could also pre-position yourself for future therapies, the antisense oligonucleotide therapies and the small interfering RNAs that are showing hugely promising results in their ability to lower LD little a. But we are awaiting phase three outcome data to see that the, the, the lowering of LP little a in higher risk populations actually reduces events. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I look more information is better. So, uh, I mean, if, if I had a genetic predis predisposition to something that was likely to, you know, raise my odds considerably of having a cardio event, especially at a younger age, I'd want to know about it. So, um, long story short, folks listening to this, um, if your doctor's not already measuring it, uh, get a measure of your ApoB so you, you kind of have that uh, knowledge in terms of where you are. That's probably one that you can more directly impact with your diet and other um, variables. And then LPA, <coughs> LP little a is just kind of worth knowing. And as Dr. Barrett said, probably you only need to have that test once just to see where you're at. So that's kind of blood work. So um, there are other tests that we can have in terms of kind of seeing, you know, how much plaque we have uh, built up, how our heart is functioning, et cetera. So let's just talk through through some of those briefly, because I think there can probably be some confusion there, uh, especially around like what's worth getting, what's worth paying out of pocket for. So do you want to start with a uh, uh, calcium scan and tell, tell us what that tells you? So when we talk about this I kind of uh, topic of cardiac CT, there are mm -hmm. two types of cardiac CT that we look to assess for the degree of plaque in someone's arteries. So this is now moving from the realm of risk factors. So again, just like LP little a, LP little a is a risk factor mm -hmm. for the disease. And the disease is viewed by the cardiac CT. Now, when we do a cardiac CT, we, we have to consider several different variables. Number one, if it is a calcium score that we're doing, so that's a non-contrast scan, a very small amount of radiation um, that is done readily accessibly, um, and is not particularly expensive. Um, and that will give you uh, what's the, the, an approximation of the amount of calcified plaque that is in your coronary arteries. So it will tell you whether or not you have any calcified plaque. If you do have any plaque, how much plaque you have, how, what that means on an approximated basis for your risk of a heart attack over the next 10 years, and ultimately where you stack up compared to an age match peer. And it is that last part actually that is probably the most crucially important detail. The CT coronary angiogram is the other test that you mentioned um, that is a, a larger amount of radiation, does require contrast, often requires beta blockers and nitrates to, to be given uh, to slow heart rate and uh, cause the arteries to dilate so we can visualize the, the contrast appropriately. And that will, we know that about 8 to 10% of patients who have a calcium score of zero can have some evidence of plaque identified on the more advanced scanning. Uh, the CT coronary angiogram, either evidence of what's called non-calcified plaque, which doesn't uh, uh, appear on the calcium score, or a very small amount of calcification that is not detected um, on the original calcium scan, Diff the difference being to do with kind of slice thickness of acquisition um, of the scans. And lastly, it also gives uh, an indication of the, 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 the probability of any obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, and it looks at some other kind of factors in terms of the, it gives a much better appreciation of the cardiac anatomy. Okay. It, and, and so, but it's important to say here, the, the thing is, is that the, the difference, the price differential between these two tests mm. will really often determine which one you're going to do. Mm -hmm. in, in Europe, there isn't a huge price difference between mm. these two tests. Interesting. Um, but I know in the US that price difference is significant. Yeah. So I'll tell you my experience. So um, I asked my doctor for all of these and uh, the cardio... I was, he prescribed the cardio calcium scan for me, uh, although I don't think it was covered by insurance for what it's worth. And to your point, that was less expensive. It was $200 out of pocket. Um, and for me, that was worth it to see what my calcium score is. By the way, uh, I was happy to see it was zero, but based on everything that you've said and other things that I've read, that doesn't necessarily give you like the you're out of the woods stamp of approval, even if it's a, even if it's a zero, um, the CT angiogram, uh, my doctor actually would not prescribe that for me. And he said, this is my general physician would not prescribe that for me. And he said, if you want 
to get that. You're going to have to ask the cardiologist to prescribe that. That was, I understand not in covered, not covered by insurance for most, uh, unless you know, you have a clear reason to get that. And my understanding also is that that's about a couple of thousand dollars. So I'm interested in two, I have two questions for you about the, the angiogram. Do you think it is worth that cost? Like, let's say somebody in my situation had a calcium, uh, score zero, not necessarily have a bunch of other factors to be worrying about. Would you, how, how high priority would you put that? And then how concerned are, are you on the radiation factor? Um, so from the radiation factor, uh, if you're if you're going to get a CT coronary angiogram, make sure that you go to a center that basically uses single heartbeat scanning. So the radiation delivered um, is incredibly small. Um, mm-hmm. So you know if you choose your center correctly, um, mm-hmm. you're choosing a, a more a more modern scanner, kind of um, with say 512 slices. You, you're going to you're going to get very minimal radiation. Um, in terms of the price difference. Um, you know, if there's a large delta, uh, like there is in the US between kind of a calcium score and a CT coronary angiogram, what I would say is, is that I think you'll get most of the bang for your buck from a calcium score. Um, you know, yes, I have patients who have, you know, uh, you know, have obstructive coronary disease with a calcium score of zero. Um, you know, we, we've all encountered those patients, but most of the time you will get, uh, you'll get the, the, the adequate amount of information. Um, what I think is interesting is that it's probably cheaper. Uh, for people in the US to jump on a flight to Europe and get a CT coronary <laughs> angiogram and fly back than it is to That's get one actually point. in. So you, and and you get a free trip and you get a trip to Europe. That's um, true. Uh, yeah. So so just just if you're thinking of doing that. Um the so the thing is though is where where I think the decision tree needs to be modified here is, is when you get the test and what you infer from that. Hmm. So if you have a younger individual and say they're a younger female and they're, you know, 48, 50 years of age and they have an early family history of heart disease and they get a calcium score of two. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, so that's a very small number, but on a percentile basis is very, very high. And so we always need to kind of see, you know, like that person should not be laying down any plaque or advanced plaque, which is what a calcium score sees mm-hmm. until probably to their mid sixties at least. Yep. And yep. so that tells them that they're, it tells me that they're way off course. And so we typically look at, say, a calcium score of greater than 100 being kind of reflective of a significantly higher risk over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, is most people who are getting these scans have many more 10-year blocks remaining. Mm-hmm. So if we have to kind of adjust our thinking around that. And so th- this is where you need to work out on a kind of percentile basis um, where you are for this. And, and sometimes you have to use you know, the, 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 the actual percentile calculations aren't immediately available. So you have to do a little bit of digging uh, for this, particularly if you're scanning someone who's less than 45 years of age. The, the, the easy test is you scan someone, say who's like 55 year old male, and they've got a calcium score of 200. You know, that's kind of easy. It's like, listen, you've got a significant burden of coronary disease, the bang for buck that you're going to guess by going on, say, lipid lowering therapy and stabilizing that plaque um, is, is, is quite substantial. Mm-hmm. The challenge is, is when you take a younger individual, say, say someone who's 42 and they do a CT calcium score and it's zero and their lipid profile is highly abnormal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what you're saying is, is, is they, their, their lifetime cardiovascular risk is elevated, mm-hmm. but their 10 year cardiovascular risk probably isn't that high. Mm-hmm. So therefore you have to have a, this is where it comes down to your kind of your preference in terms of. So say, say you have a likely a familial hyperlipidemia phenotype, you genetically high cholesterol, you've done kind of the lifestyle stuff. You've, you've really tried to make an effort, you know, within kind of a reasonable range and you're not making a, a kind of a considerable dent on, on your lipid profile. And the question is, is should I go on a lipid lowering therapy? The reality is, is over what time horizon are you trying to make a difference? Because if you have someone with a calcium score of zero, their risk of an event over the next 10 years is very, very low in the order of probably less than 2%. So therefore, the ability to make a dent on that with anything is, is, is very modest. But the reality is, is you're not really interested in the risk over the next 10 years. You're interested in the risk over the next 50. Mm-hmm. And that is where you get real spreading of the curves kind of later on. So, so this, is, this is often a much more kind of difficult conversation in terms of optimization of risk factors in the setting of someone, say, who's 42 years of age and you know, male or female, but they, they, you know, they have high blood pressure, or they have kind of higher lipids. They're going to go, well, you know, it's great. I've, I've no evidence of plaque in my coronary artery. It was like, no, you've no evidence of the disease. 
yet, mm-hmm. but we wouldn't expect you to have any evidence of the disease. Yeah. But you yeah. still have sign- several of the risk factors. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face here in the US anyways. And I, I would imagine the same is true in Europe is that, you know, the healthcare system and certainly insurance are kind of set up more for what are those 10 year risks look like. But I'm sitting here at 45 years old as an example and concerned with a much longer time horizon than that. And to your earlier point around, you know, the number of tennis balls you're throwing and how hard you're throwing them and how over what time period you're throwing them, this is a cumulative game here. This is not a point in time game. So that's why personally I'm so interested in measuring all of these things now and seeing where I'm at and proactive, not waiting for that calcium score to be something other than zero before kind of proactively taking measures to. Yeah. But, 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 well, but this, this goes back to your, your, the, the fundamental model. And this is, I suppose what, what Peter Atia talks about is that if you look at our healthy centenarian population and you compare them to ourselves and you ask, what do we die from and what do they die? From? Mm-hmm. Broadly, we will die as, as an adult in the, in the developed world from either cardiovascular disease, cancer, or dementia. If you're a non-smoker, clearly if you're a smoker, the, the chances of respiratory diseases and lung cancer goes through the roof. But if you take someone who's remotely interested in their health, they're probably not going to be a smoker. So cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia. If you look at healthy centenarians and you ask, what is it that they die from? They die from mostly the same things, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. The key difference between them and us, they get those conditions on average 20 to 25 years later than everybody else. So if your model is the healthy centenarian, your priority and your goal has to be to delay the onset of a major chronic disease, either cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia by 20 to 25 years. And you can only do that by aggressively managing the risk factors. So therefore, waiting for your calcium score to be abnormal before initiating an aggressive approach to managing your risk factors is not applying that model. Well said. Um, Okay, the last one, stress echo test. I just had one. um, I sent you the results, probably too much information uh, shared here. But uh, what are your thoughts here? Is this something that is worth getting? And for what it's worth, I think in the US, I want to say it was something like $400 out of pocket. But then again, I asked my doctor to prescribe me this and I was not, uh, for insurance did not deem my risk uh, or whatever profile worthy of needing it. So what are your thoughts there? I would say probably take the $400 and buy yourself and your partner a really nice Michelin star restaurant meal. Um, (laughs) Okay. Well, well, that's uh, ship has sailed already, but go ahead. So, well, I'm being tongue in cheek. So the, 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 the reality here is you have to ask, what question am I trying to answer? And how is it going to, is it going to change how I uh, make a next step, step or decision? And mm-hmm. so when you're doing a stress echo, you're, you're ultimately answering two questions. One is you're getting standard echo. So you're getting a functional evaluation of your heart. So, you know, cardiovascular anatomy, valvular function, et cetera. Um, and so that's, you're, you're getting a, a standard echo in there. The stress echo part of it is basically a functional test looking for the presence of changes on the heart that would indicate obstructive coronary artery disease. Okay. So, so really kind of the stress echo, if you, if you think about it, what you're looking for is you're saying, I believe with a reasonably high degree of, of, uh, you know, pretest probability that this person has obstructive coronary disease. And I'm going to use a functional study on this individual to see whether there's any degree of ischemia as manifest typically on a stress echo by changes in the way that the wall kind of uh, moves uh, after, say, the dibutamine or whatever uh, agent is given. And then, but then you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do with that information? Now, you might say, well, I now kind of identified that I have obstructive coronary disease. And you go, okay, but your priority here is, is managing the disease, which is a disease of biology. So you're going to maximize all your risk factors, make sure you're on the appropriate medical therapy for chronic coronary syndromes. Typically, if you've an abnormal stress echo, your, your calcium score will have been significantly abnormal. It's, it's possible that you have a calcium score of zero, but in general, um, it's likely going to be abnormal. But now you're, you're, you're in one of the murkiest parts of cardiology, and that is revascularization in the setting of asymptomatic obstructive coronary disease. And that is what cardiologists are fighting about for many years after the publication of a very large trial called the ischemia trial. Um, and if you have obstructive coronary disease, it really does make total sense that if you could block the artery, opening it would make things better, but, but it doesn't. 
is is the hmm. is the answer. Uh, it's a lovely theory. It really does, and we 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 we've, we've tested this, and it it doesn't. Basically, people don't live longer. They don't have less heart attacks. Um, and in general, if you're doing it, you're doing it to make people feel better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay. so always, yeah, always go back to your base question. What is it that I'm trying to answer? And yep. so that's an ischemia test. Okay. Okay. Got it. What, I, what I'm trying to answer apparently is spending as much money as I can on <laughs> tests I may or may not need. But uh, uh, this has become a little bit of a hobby for me at, at some point, just because I just love the information. It's so interesting to me to see, um, you know, where I land on all this stuff. Um, okay. But that's helpful. So I realize we're, we're uh, sort of running a bit low on time here, but uh, we talked a lot about, you know, the different risk factors, how to measure them, and then uh, just talked about the, uh, you know, how you can assess kind of where, how, how far disease, how far this d- disease has progressed, assuming that you've got signs of it. So let's talk about what you can do to move the needle. So let's say... I listen to this podcast and I say, okay, I want to focus on my ApoB. I want to understand what that number looks like. And I want to start seeing what I can do to lower that number. What have you seen that is proven to work? Uh, First of all, would that be the measure? But second of all, what have you seen that is proven to work to actually bring down that that number or that, that risk? So what I would start with is, is I think the ApoB is obviously very, very important uh, in all of this, but I think you, you need to look at kind of the highest uh, levels in terms of your overall health, in terms of your, your longevity. We know that physical fitness is probably one of the biggest determinants of that. Um, and so that is, again, going back to the integrity of the glass. Um, and so we know that those with the highest levels of VO2 max um, in the elite ranges, about top 2.5%, and that's for a normal population, not kind of the Olympian population, um, you know, are about six times less likely to die on average over a 10-year time frame compared to someone in the bottom 25%. We know that there's significant advantages to running um, higher levels of muscle mass um, and muscle strength. Um, and we know that your your the, the other major factor is your insulin sensitivity. So always ask yourself, where am I on an insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance continuum? And everyone's on some part of that scale. Um, and so in terms of, you know, putting a kind of a package of things together, the way I would look at this, say, listen, number one, how aggressive do I plan on being? Number two, over what time horizon do I want to make a difference? And if you're trying to be the most aggressive uh, as possible um, over the longest time horizon, you want an ApoB at less than the fifth percentile. You want a normal blood pressure for as long as possible. And that is 120-ish or below uh, for a systolic blood pressure over your lifetime, ideally gotten there through lifestyle means, but if needed later in life through pharmacotherapies, you want to run a VO2 max kind of at least above the kind of in the top 25th percentile, at least you want above average. Uh, Same with muscle mass, muscle strength. The same in terms of insulin sensitivity. You want an objective measure of insulin sensitivity. Um, and the, these are kind of the, the, the constellations of tests uh, that you're going to, to aggregate to, to, to minimize the, the timing of the onset uh, of the disease. Thank you for that. That's, uh, I, I love that kind of holistic approach. So for, for me personally, some of the things that I'm focusing on are, one is uh, I've been meaning to get a DEXA scan, but I'm going to do that. And I, I'm kind of tentatively thinking about getting a DEXA scan either annually or even twice a year to understand what that body fat percentage is, what that visceral fat makeup is. Um, two would be the the VO2 max. I've not officially had my VO2 max uh, measured, but um, there, there, I have some approximations and the Apple Watch gives you a number. Who knows how accurate that is? Um, but that is something I'd like to get tested annually. And then I would say ApoB as well. So those are like three things that personally I'm looking at and want to get measured on a somewhat regular basis because my philosophy is, you know, kind of what gets measured gets managed. And so I like the idea of having these, you know, let's say just a few numbers that I can kind of measure myself against. And I presume some of them will drift and maybe get a little worse with age. But if I can have a target to aim at, that really helps me. Do you, is, what do you think about that approach? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, in terms of, you, you know, you have to do the, that model of asking yourself, what is it that you want to be doing at 85 years of age? 
Mm -hmm. um, and if what you want to be doing is kind of more than average for most 85 year olds, you need to be more than average for your current uh, age. Yeah. And so when someone says, listen, I'm okay in terms of my, my, my risk parameter is at the 50th percentile and you go, okay, that's uh, the mean of the population. That's average. The average age of heart attacks in males is 65 and the average age of heart attacks in females is 72. Average is not a safe place to hang out. Hmm. And again, it depends on your goals. People will say to me, listen, what do you say to the person who's sitting at home, you know, smoking cigarettes, eating packets of Doritos and, you know, doing no exercise? My answer mm -hmm. is, is I'm not your mother, you know, and mm. you could do whatever, you know, you do whatever you want to do. But if you want to achieve kind of uh, those, those higher performance metrics, I'll, I'll help guide you there. Uh, and, and so it's about setting out what your goals are and then working backwards to see where you need to be now to achieve those goals. And I, I will just, I just want to add one, one other thing just about the calcium scoring. Mm -hmm. um, because you can get this out of pocket in, in the United States, you can walk in and get a, a CT calcium score. What I will say is younger individuals who are getting it, one thing you need to be very careful about before getting it is that if you have an early family history of heart disease, you get a CT calcium score and it's grossly abnormal or even mildly abnormal for kind of a, a 40 year old male or a female. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that your life insurance is all sorted out before that you've got, you've got this. And you need to make mm -hmm. sure that your mortgage uh, life insurance is all sorted out. You need to make sure that you do not hand a life insurer a major stick to beat you with and give you no opportunity to get life insurance uh, mm. for this. So be careful okay. is all I will say. I didn't even, that did not cross my mind, but that makes a ton of sense. That could be a potential downside of getting a test like that. But so great, great call there. Okay. Um, this has been really educational for me. I've been looking for the, forward to this conversation for a while because like I said up front, I just eat up every bit of content that you put out because I, I just find it so valuable. So um, it's been great and I really appreciate it, but I also want to get you out of here. So I do want to ask you my standard closing question, which is to zoom way out from everything we've been talking about, um, or maybe your answer is related, I don't know, but um, what is one thing that you believe that you've figured out in life that maybe most others haven't yet? The point is we're all dying. Uh, clock is ticking. The reason we think about our health is so that we can use that time appropriately. I actually see health as a second order um, important factor. The only reason it's important to live a long life and a healthy life is to use your time wisely, to spend it with those you love and to do the things that gives you the most agency and sense of being in the world. Um, these are second order priority um, topics. They are the platform and the, uh, and the optionality to do whatever it is that's going to make you the best version of you. Um, and so you set that platform right, and then you've got the big task ahead of you, which is actually the, the, the great work of your life in terms of becoming who you are. Wow. Well, this podcast is called Intentional Wisdom, and I feel like that was some real wisdom you just dropped there to end this conversation. So thank you for that. I love that. Um, okay. So if people want to check out your um, newsletter and your Twitter and all that kind of stuff, I'll link to it, all your um handles and everything in the show notes, but anything that you want to mention specifically in terms of where people can find you? Yeah, you can find me most commonly on uh, Twitter. Just go to Dr. Patty Barge and most of the other socials or uh, go to my Substack. If you just type in Dr. Patty Barge Substack, you'll find it all there. Yeah. And it's, it's really good. I don't know how you keep coming up with uh, great ideas to write about, but there's also a treasure trove of information there. If you go through the back catalog of all the different articles that you've written um, over time. So uh, Dr. Patty Barrett, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, folks, there you have it. Dr. Patty Barrett, go check him out on Twitter and LinkedIn and Substack. Uh, I will share the links to all this handles in the show notes, uh, but clearly I'm very interested in the stuff that he is writing and putting out there into the world. I think it's super helpful. He has a nice way of uh, taking what can be a pretty dry topic and turning it into very interesting uh, content that answers a lot of questions that I certainly have about heart health. And it's a topic that I'm very uh, interested in. And, uh, you know, given family history and other things, it's something that I want to stay on top of and something that I want to be measuring my progress versus some of these risk factors. So his content is super helpful uh, in that regard. Also, along those same lines, what I'm going to do in this week's newsletter, if it's helpful to you, is I'm going to share just a really simple spreadsheet that I've been using to track my own numbers, things like ApoB and uh, LDL cholesterol and such. 
And I tried to track down kind of what are the recommended levels uh, in the U.S. healthcare system for some of these numbers, and then also what uh, Dr. Peter Atia, the author of Outlive, is recommending for the numbers as well. And then I compare where I am and on all these things. So simple, very crude spreadsheet, nothing magic about it, but I want to share it with you just because I created it myself and I thought um, maybe you'd be interested in tracking your numbers uh, the same way. So I wanted to give you that framework that's helpful. So look for that in the newsletter, gregcampion.substack.com. If you're not already subscribed, I'd love to have you join us over there. Lastly, if you're enjoying the podcast, please go ahead and leave a review or a comment on whichever platform you're on uh, and tell a friend. Uh, I will take the positive PR where I can get it. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening, my friend, and I will see you next time.